right? We read through, we listened to the scripture reading earlier, right? Go, going from the, uh, the capital punishment, the sentence to death, right, of Jesus, uh, his crucifixion, right, uh, to the time on the cross and, and then uh, to his moment of death, right, his burial, and then three days and three nights later, right, his resurrection. And you work that backwards, right? Three days and three nights, 24 hours, three times 24 hour cycles. And by before Sunday morning, he was already up. You will find that um, he died on a Wednesday, not a Friday. Okay? But this three days and three nights, right, was enough to certify, to, to ascertain, right, that he was dead. Right, at the moment of death, what happened? He cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. Tell, tell the story, all right? It means pay in full. Whatever sinful man right, owes to God, um, the payment that none of us are able to pay or are unable to make, because we cannot provide the, the desired currency, right? When you travel, you must pay with the correct currency when you're in a foreign place. And none of us could pay that because God's requirement was perfect, absolute righteousness. Notice, it's not whether you are a good person or not. God's standard requirement is, are you absolutely perfect, right, without a single lapse? And the truth is, none of us can make that standard. Every single one of us fall short, which is why in Romans chapter 3, right, it tells us for all, everyone, right, everybody, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, but there's none righteous, no, not one, not a single one, no matter how good, right, someone may be. And so, we have to realize that, that the death, right, or burial and the burial was necessary, right, at the moment he died, um, he laid down his life. Death didn't just occur to him. He voluntarily died. I'll put it another way. He, by his own choice, at that very moment, chose to stop living. You get what I'm saying? Okay? The only way a human being can do that is to commit suicide. All right? To attempt to kill themselves. But he said he has the power to lay down his life, to put it, to lay it down, but then to take it up again. Okay? I don't know of uh, electrical devices or, or electronic devices that can power themselves down and they can do that, but they can't power themselves up. Not without something still actually being powered. Right? Still on battery power or something that, so that they can initiate the startup. But he snuffed out his own life and then three days and three nights later came back to life again. Why? Because he is not limited by death. And rising, right? His resurrection, rising from the grave, right? At the appointed time, not as he's in control. He said three days and three nights, right on schedule. Um, the fact that he can rise up, right? He can come back to life again on his own accord when he wants to shows also demonstrates that he is, has power even over death, right? Um, death cannot hold him, right? That, that he is Lord even over death, and therefore, you know what? He is more than qualified to be Lord of your salvation and mine. Because if he is not Lord, if he does not have authority, he cannot be your savior. But we're going to come to Luke chapter 24, right? And what we're going to see here uh, is that there are a number of uh, different reactions Right, in Luke 20, chapter 24, uh, on the part of the disciples and the people around when they uh, realized that Christ rose from the, from the dead, right? And we begin with the empty tomb that perplexed everyone. Here we see, right? They went to the tomb on the Sunday morning. Look at verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, okay, not the Sabbath, not the last day of the week, which is the Sabbath, but on the first day of the week, right, the Sunday, it said very early in the morning. Notice before dawn, what happens? He was already up. Okay, 
they came onto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Now, why did they do that? Because the previous day was the Sabbath. There was no work. Right? According to the law of Moses, they could do no work. So they could not go and, uh, and you know, prepare the body and all these things because why? It was the Sabbath. And prior to that, it was the Passover. Now, but when they went there, they had a, there was a very disturbing discovery because the stone barring the entrance had already been rolled away. Look at verse 2. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. Right? Now, this is not a small stone. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Right? So, this was, there was a huge stone that was placed in front of the entrance now to prevent anyone from going in and to prevent anyone from, or anything from coming out. Nothing's going to come in or out. And this was placed as a precaution by the Pharisees and the chief priests because they were concerned about what Jesus had said with respect to his resurrection. Look at Matthew chapter 27, all right, in verse 62, because here it says, Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together onto Pilate. Right? They came together as a delegation to Pontius Pilate now, and then they brought a petition to him, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, wow, you know, right up to this point, you could see they rejected him, right? Uh, they were still clinging on to their unbelief, right? And so they called him the a deceiver, but just in case, right? Just in case, what, what happens? Is that we need to do something. So that the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. Now, it's very interesting that from in their mind, right? The only way that um, the Son of God, that Jesus could rise from the dead was because this had to be faked, right? Now, ordinarily, I think we all would also think the same. The problem was this, right? Over and over again, and we dealt with this uh, in the last few messages, that his miracles were authenticated, right? They were undeniable, Right? Over and over again, they had opportunity to see that Jesus had and wielded the power of God, including raising the dead. And yet, their only conclusion is this has to be fake. See, at this point, this is not about um, whether they had or did not have the information. This is about a willful decision or choice not to believe. So what did they tell Pilate? Look at verse 64. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day. Now, that's to make sure it means to secure the sepulchre, this grave, this tomb, right, which belonged to um, Joseph of Arimathea, right, uh, this tomb that was never used before. Okay, Isaiah 53 tells us that he would make his, his grave would be, be in the grave of a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. He had just hewn this thing out of rock, right? Preparing for his own ev eventual death. And guess what? It's brand new. No one has used it before. The first one to use it was Jesus, not Joseph. Not only that, I would point out something here, very interesting. Um, Jesus, in his death, borrowed a tomb for three days. You realize that Jesus, in his birth, borrowed a womb for nine months? Never used before. Born, that's why it says, born of a virgin. All right? This womb, nine months, he borrowed that. And then here in this tomb, three days and three nights. Now, they said, right, um, they asked Pilate, let's secure this place. Why? Lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead so that the last error shall be worse than the first. Now, right to the very end, you'll see they're holding on to this idea, right? That he is a deceiver. He, uh, you know, he's teaching heresy, uh, it's error. And they said, right, that in case his disciples come, they steal the body and then they make this false claim that he is risen from the dead. Now, so what did Pilate do? Verse 65, Pilate said unto them, ye have a watch. All right, he grants the authority, and it says, go your way and make it as sure as you can. All right? So he says, okay, you have a guard. 
make this as secure as possible. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now, so try and picture this now, right? That a huge stone now covers and blocks the entrance. Okay, this is not something that uh, even maybe just a group of us here are going to be able to move. Okay, it's going to take more than just us, right? I'm sure Vincent will, will understand, right? We need heavy plant equipment and all that, right? Because, uh, you know, combat engineer, right? And the thing is this, this was not going to be something that you can just move. But what did they do? They not only put the, the stone there to cover the entrance, making sure that no one could go in and, not, and nothing could come out. They sealed the, the stone, right? They placed seals, official seals on the stone, which meant that even if you attempted to even touch or tamper with this thing, the seal would break, right? And then they set a watch, right? Roman guards, right? Roman infantry soldiers were placed there. And this was such that the soldiers would be there guarding this place round the clock, Obviously, there were shifts, right? But they were guarding this around the clock. And here's the problem, right? If any one soldier was found sleeping, right? It's one of the things that always happens during guard duty, right? Or when we are on standby, defending a location, right? During our national service, right? We go 50-50, half will be asleep, half will be awake. And by around the second or third shift, half are supposed to be awake, uh, are asleep, and then the other half are also asleep. And by, you know, and by 4 a.m. or so, nobody's awake. Now, one soldier found sleeping, and they will all be executed. Okay? They don't get to sign extra duty. They, they get... And so... You have to realize this was very serious business as far as the guards were concerned, all right? Nobody wanted to lose their head or to die or to be crucified. Now, but something happened just before dawn um, that was unexpected, right? Matthew chapter 28, look at verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, right? Notice at the end of that Saturday. Now, to help us with this, realize, right, the way this is counted is, Romans counted this from the dawn, the morning, to the next dawn, okay? Morning and night, morning and night cycle, right? Uh, for us, we, we look at what? It's when you hit 12 a.m., right? And that's a new day, okay? For them, it's at the dawn. And so here, at the end of that Sabbath, right? This is now Sunday morning. It, and notice, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, notice, the sun is rising, but it's now just about to become Sunday morning. Right? Came Ma Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. Now, you realize when we meet here, okay, every Sunday, we call this the Lord's Day, why? Right? Because he's risen from the dead on the first day of the week. Okay? We don't just remember and commemorate that once a year. But every Sunday, when we come and we assemble, right? On the first day of the week. And so they came, these women came to the sepulcher. But notice verse 2, right? And behold, there was a great earthquake. Why? For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Wow. I, I always try to picture this. Because it's so casual, right? This huge stone that humans had difficulty moving. And yet here, the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. He came, he rolled back the stone, and then nonchalantly just sat on top of the stone. La, 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 waiting. But look at his, the, the description of how he looks. His countenance, how he looked, right? It was like lightning and his raiment, right? His clothing, white as snow. And guess what? It was terrifying. Because for the guards that were there, notice verse 4, and for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. They were in shock, right? They were terrified. And, you know, and basically, you imagine, they, they're all lying there like dummies after that, shell-shocked, unable to react, all right? With the angel of the Lord sitting on top of the stone. 
so the women came to the sepulcher, right? Because they, the, after they had done all the preparations, remember the preparations had to be done. Okay? These were preparations, spices, all these things that they are going to now right, embalm the body of Jesus. Okay? And as we do that, even for burial, to what? To slow down, retard any decomposition. But the day of preparation was on the Friday because Saturday was the Sabbath, no work. Right? No work was allowed. So they prepared. They couldn't go to the tomb because it was the Sabbath. Now, the moment the Sabbath was over, that Sunday morning, they went there. Right? And so it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. Right? Because right, here they find the stone was rolled away. The body is not there. They brought everything you know, all ready to prepare to the body. He's missing. The much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why see ye the living among the dead? Right? Now, this was terrifying. They, they saw the, the two angels there, right? And they were afraid. And what did they do? They bowed down their faces to the ground, right? Now, it's a, a mark of humility. Right, a uh, uh, submission, they dare not look directly upon them, but as if reading their minds or what's in their hearts, right? The angels ask this question, why are you looking for the living in the wrong place? Why are you going to a cemetery to look for the living? I don't know about you, I would not want to go to a cemetery to look for people, right, for the living. But here, they were perplexed. They were, uh, the word means to be in doubt, entirely at a loss. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to react because they went there expecting to see actually a huge stone blocking the entrance. And they were, the question on their mind was, how are we going to get in? But the stone was rolled away. All right? You got the Roman guys lying around Right, as if they're casualties. Two men, right, in shining garments there. But the body of Jesus was missing. And so this bombshell of a question, right? Why seek ye the living? Right? The living Christ among dead people. You're not gonna find him there. Right? And so we see the exciting news of the resurrection. Look at verse 6. Because the angels now leave the instructions, the, declare the news to the women, and then leave instructions to them. He is not here. Simple answer. He's not here, but he is risen. Risen from the grave, risen from the dead. All right? And he says, remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee? Don't you remember? Why are you surprised? You see, I want us to realize something here, right? That um, there are going to be times, right, that things, the truths that are going to take some time to sink in. Because we can sit here Sunday after Sunday, right? It goes in, in one year, out the other, right? We hear the same thing. Yeah, yeah, okay, Pastor, I get you. I heard this, right? Many times I heard this, I heard this. You notice something here. The disciples... And the women, right, they were all told, Jesus had repeatedly told them how that the Son of Man will be arrested, will be uh, afflicted by the, right, the, the leaders, the rulers, and then what happens? He'll be put to death, but then three days and three nights later, he is going to rise from the, from the dead, right? And he said, you destroy this body, referring to his body, what happens? Uh, destroy this temple, he says, I will raise it up again. He said, I, not, not somebody else, I will raise it up. And yet, all this time, I want us to realize something here, you know, the thing about us as humans, right? We're thinking and we're trying to figure things out. As we're trying to figure things out, we're thinking, nah, this is, how is that possible? Maybe Jesus meant this figuratively, right? Maybe he meant something else, right? And so uh, how, this can't be true. Remember the night in which he was betrayed, he even identified who will be the person that will betray him. 
And even though as he identified Judas Iscariot, right, as the one, um, and Judas left not long after that, in their minds, they thought, nah, can't be. Right? He must have gone to give away some money to the poor, so on and so forth. And I want us to realize something here. You and I can sit here and then try to reason things out on our own. We'll try to figure things out on our own. And you know, when, even when the Lord tells us, right, you know what, you just have to repent towards God. Don't try to hold on to your own righteousness. Uh, you got to give up on your own attempts, right? Just admit, just agree with God, all right, with the Father about the fact that you and I are sinners without hope. And then, you know, you know turn to Him. And then, trust in his solution, which is, is this belief on my son, right, who has done everything that is necessary that you and I may be saved. But you know something? No matter, I, I, there, there are times I've done this in Bible studies and uh, with men, and guess what? They'll say, no, no, it cannot be so simple. I said, there's something else, something missing. Maybe there's something, and they're trying to figure out that there's something I must do to add on to what is already done. And so, notice, this has been repeated to them, and now that they needed to be remind, reminded, it says, remember now. Right? Remember how he spake unto you. Right? Saying, verse 7, the Son of Man must be delivered. You see that? It was, it was a requirement in the scriptures and in the prophets. Right? Must be delivered, notice, into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Right? This would be today, so many times around the world, people campaign. Right? They advocate right, to remove the death sentence. All right. The biggest concern is what if we put an innocent person to death? I don't see a lot of them being very concerned about the fact that Jesus of Nazareth, all right, the Son of God, was wrongly condemned. Here you notice he was delivered into the hands of sinful men, referring to the elders and the rulers of Israel. The spiritual leadership. And yet, in spite of that, right, God's plan cannot be overturned. God's plan cannot be overturned even by the worst evil that this world can produce. Because why? It worked out God's plan of salvation. That's the irony of it. All right, the angel then assured the women and told them this, right? Matthew chapter 28, verse 5. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Jesus. Right? I know. You're looking for him. But I like this next part, which was crucified. Past tense. Was. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said. Right? Notice something. What Jesus said he will do, he does. Right? He promised three days and three nights later he will arise from the dead. Guess what? He did it. Right? And he says, I know you're looking for him. He was crucified, but he's not here anymore. Right? He's risen from the dead. As he said, as he claims. Now come see the place where the Lord lay. Right? See for yourself. Right? This was where he was. This was where his body was laid down, but he's not there anymore. Verse 7 and go quickly. Right? Right. This is important news. Right, don't delay. Go quickly and tell his disciples. By the way, just in case um, we're not clear, right? The women there were also disciples. And the women were the first witnesses, right, concerning the resurrection. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he go before you in, get into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Right, he says, go tell everyone. Let everyone know the news right now. Today, it's a lot easier for us, right? You just post on social media, right? And it's going to go viral. But here, the way they had to do it was to go manual, right? Manual, but it's viral. They tell someone, someone tells a few other people, and, and, among, and the whole network of disciples, right, were to be informed. 
And then not only that, that he's not only risen, but that there is a rendezvous. He's going into Galilee, meet him there. But again, I want us to know something here because the women were given right, a very interesting, very important ministry. They were the first to know about the resurrection and they were the first witnesses concerning the resurrection. Okay, they're not second class. Verse 8, and they remembered his words. Bing, oh, yeah, oh. I know it happens to many of us. Sometimes um, there's stuff here over the last few weeks, right, that I'm reading, studying, I'm going back over and over again. I mean, I must have done this, right, going through the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ countless times, and then I'm discovering something new. I'm realizing, whoa, how come I didn't notice this before? And they remember his words. Repetition is important. And return from the sepulchre, right? Immediately, he noticed they didn't just remember and they, ah, okay. There was action. And returned from the sepulchre and told all these things onto the 11 and to all the rest. So you see two groups of people here, the 11 of the apostles. Why? Because Judas hanged himself already. And then the rest of the disciples, right? Word starts getting out. But as word got out, um, the reports were dismissed initially as nonsense. All right, verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them. Now, it's a mixed group of people, by the way. Even among the women. Okay? Because in our, in our minds, that kind of honor to be the first bearers of that kind of news um, would go to like the most righteous, the most spiritual. But, you know, it was a mixed bunch. Why? Because there is none righteous. No, not one. But when Christ redeems us, guess what? All of us can be vessels fit for his use. And here, now they bring this news, right? It says, which told these things unto the apostles, right? The eleven. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Why? Now, you remember one thing. Jesus was betrayed, right? He was arrested. He was put through a mockery of a trial, was brutally beaten, right? And then subject to, right, condemned to death, right, by through crucifixion, which, by the way, is a slow death by suffocation. Okay, once you're hanging on the cross that way, it's very hard to actually get air in. Right? The only way you can breathe in is to push down on your feet where they nail you right through the nerves. Okay, I can tell you firsthand, nerve pain is one of the worst things ever. Okay? It was it's worse than being cut open. And to push down just to be able to heave in some air. And as you get weaker, right, it gets harder and harder to do that. Yet, it's a slow and painful death because it can take as long as seven days for a person to die by crucifixion. Right? Because the Passover was coming, they needed to speed things up. And what happened to the two thieves on the cross was that the, the order was given, right? They needed, they could not have the bodies hanging on the cross through the Passover and through the Sabbath. So they broke their legs, why? So that they could no longer push down, right? Push down on the, near the ankles there so that they can breathe, right? And once they couldn't breathe, what happens? They died of suffocation very quickly. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. Romans, the Romans uh, certified that death when the soldier pierced that spear right through his side and what came out was blood and water, right? Why? Because the spear penetrated the heart and what came out was blood and water. And that normally happens when the heart has been getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And uh, I remember, right, years ago when my grandmother went to hospital, they had to pump out, I think it was 19 liters of water, right, over a period of time. And so, he died horrifically, and, and in their minds, like, this is not possible. How can he, how can anyone come back from the, right, from the dead like that, right? And so this is too good to be true. Now, I want us to think about what's going through their minds, right? They're going through a very difficult time. 
Okay? The shock and the loss and the pain and the mourning and the grieving. And now, oh, he's alive. And they're like, this is a very bad joke. And so they believe them not. But Peter and John, John ran to verify this information. All right, verse 12. Then arose Peter and ran onto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed. But notice this, right? His reaction again. He sees the evidence visually in front of him, then wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. What's going on? You see, just seeing this visual proof and all that was not enough because for Peter, he's still wondering, okay, he's not there. But what does this mean? All right, remember, they, Jesus himself had told them he will rise again. All right, there were eyewitnesses, right? The women came to the tomb, they came back, they said, he's alive, he's not there. And Peter is sitting there, what's going on? I don't get it. Right, John 20, verse 3 and 4, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple, referring to John, right, and came to the sepulchre there. So they, both, they ran both together and the disciple, other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. Right? So apparently John had better cardio and uh, outran Peter. Right? But both of them went there. So it wasn't just what Peter noticed. Two of them, they could verify, they could, they could confirm this. Again, nobody knew what to make of this. Let's move on. Look at verse 13, because we see the sad exchange on the Amos Road. All right, because now Luke's gospel switches over to a different account concerning two men that were taking a walk, right, to another village away from Jerusalem towards Amos. Verse 13, and behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Amos, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. All right, in other words, three score, one score is 20, three score, so it's 60 furlongs. Okay, that's a distance of about 12 kilometers. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. Now, the name of this place, right, Emma's, now it's a village. The name literally means warm baths. All right, Brother Jack, instantly my head was like, wow, on sand. Maybe they, they were thinking probably it's like, you know what? That's not, right? Maybe in the minds of this, these disciples, right? It's like, Jesus is dead, right? No point being in church. Let's go for a nice warm bath, right? Let's just soak away you know, just let the bath just soak away all the stress, right? all the pain that we had to deal with. Right? The historian Josephus, right? he's a Jewish historian, no friend of Christians, does mention Eros at the same distance, but uh, it's not been identified, I mean, archaeologically, where it is. Okay? There is another place, but it's misidentified because it's too far. All right? This is... Like I said, it's about 12 kilometers away. So they, they walk there. And so along the way comes a stranger who joins in in that journey. And as they walk, they were talking. Verse 15, And it came to pass that while they communed together, all right, and reasoned. Notice here, they're talking, they're walking, talking, chatting, and they were reasoning things out. They're trying to figure things out. The next thing is, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But look at verse 16. This is interesting. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Right? He joins in, walks with them, but he sets it up such that they would not recognize him. Not visually. Not initially. Okay? Imagine that. Right? I don't know how that can be done. Huh? You know, so, I mean, usually, you know, Jack, we will have to put on some sort of disguise, right? You know, wear fake glasses with a mustache or, or something like that. Or, you know, I wear a beard or a hat. But um, here, Jesus makes, does this such that the disciples are not going to be able to recognize him. 
right? And these two are moving away from Jerusalem, are moving away from where they should be because of the things that happened. Now, we see in, that Jesus, in a number of our post-resurrection uh, appearances, also initially hid his appearance from the disciples, right? Mark 16, verse 12, after that he appeared in, notice, in another form onto two of them as they walked and went into the, the country. Very likely, it's the same, uh, right? It's the same two that were walking to Amos. Right, look at John 20, verse 14. And when she had thus said, she turned back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. John 21, verse 4 and 5. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, right? Peter and the other, some of the other disciples went fishing all night. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. Couldn't recognize him at all. And so here he joins in, right? Stealthily, and they are walking together, three of them now. And he's listening to their conversation, right? To what they're talking about. And finally, he now asks them a question. Verse 17, and he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another? Right? What kind of conversation is this? Right? As ye walk and are sad. Right? I can imagine along that 12 kilometer journey, there's a lot. Ah, what a sign. A lot of lamentation. Maybe regret, right? If I had known all this would happen, I would never have joined up, right, as a disciple, maybe. Or, you know, did, maybe they're wondering, right, did we waste our time? Right? Was this the wrong Messiah that we believed in? Were we misled? So on and so forth. There are many questions, right? And, and so Jesus is asking, what are you guys talking about? Right? Why are you saying all these things? And then, you know, and, and then as you walk and you are s- sorrowful, you're sad. And so one of them replies, right? And verse 18, and the one of them whose name was Cleophas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And has not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Right? And so they're asking him, wait, you mean, okay, I'll, let me translate this into modern language, right? It's like someone saying, you mean, are you, are you saying you are only born yesterday? I mean, where were you? How come you didn't know about this, right? And, and this, this is like the latest news that is, has hit Jerusalem. It's all over. Everybody knows, Right? And, and remember, they are traveling from Jerusalem. So the assumption is, look, if you came from Jerusalem, how is it that you did not know? Right? But their discussions reveal very much, I think, the things that were bothering them, including their emotions. And so Cleophas now explains to Jesus, right, in verse 19, and he said unto them, What things? What are you talking about? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Notice, they said, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. All right? Here, he's saying Jesus of Nazareth, right? He is a prophet of God. Notice, uh, a prophet who preached with the authority from God. A prophet who was authenticated through the miracles that he had performed, a prophet who was recognized, authenticated by God and also recognized by the people. Okay, so what happened to him? Verse 20, because Cleophas now talks about the grave injustice that was perpetuated. Right, verse 20, and how the chief priests and our rulers, right, the rulers of the synagogues, and the, the spiritual leadership, what happens? They made a decision here. Delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. You would think, right? I mean, this is what Clovis is saying. You would think being the spiritual leaders, right? 
ones who are close to God, who have a lot of access to the Word of God, would be able to recognize that this Jesus of Nazareth, right, a prophet mighty in word and deed before God and before the people, right, they would have recognized him. Instead, they did not. They condemned him to death. Right, they accused him of being a heretic, being a false teacher, right, and, and then being a blasphemer, and then they sentenced him to death. Right? They crucified him. And Acts chapter 2, verse 22, puts it in a very different way, right? Because Peter, on the day of Pentecost, preaches before uh, in Jerusalem and mentions how the spiritual leaders had condemned Jesus to death by crucifixion. Now, he says, ye men of Israel, hear these words. There's Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs. All right, so let's be clear. The wonders and signs, all these things, authenticate all right, the Son of God. Authenticate the prophet sent from God. Approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, now, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So, not only was he approved, but notice he performed those miracles, how? To God. <coughs> right? And this happened in the midst of you. Notice, you saw it. Happened before your very eyes. And it says, as ye yourselves also know. You can't deny it. You saw it with your own eyes. But then look at verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Right? God allowed it. It says, ye have taken. All right, Peter lays it in, on all these people, right? Ye have taken, and notice, and by wicked hands are crucified and slain. He accuses them of murder. Okay? Through unjust means, right? Condemning an innocent man to death. Okay? Demanding actually a um, condemned criminal, right, Barabbas, to be released in exchange. And wow, we can do a whole message on Barabbas because here we're going to see this whole atonement and the, the exchange. You know, it's all pictured there, right? The guilty being set free, instead, Christ being condemned. And so, but here, all these things that happened, and, and then as close up, as Clovis was uh, explaining to Jesus, Right? They were disappointed in the turn of events. Verse 21. But we trusted. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Why did they say that? But we trusted that he should have been the one. Right? He ought to have been the one to redeem Israel, but he is dead. He's dead. No more. Our hope has been extinguished. All right? The light has been snuffed out. All right? Messiah is dead. There is no more hope. This is where they are. All right? In terms of their thoughts, in terms of their emotions. All right? Everything that they have placed their faith and trust on crumbled and collapsed. Three days ago. It says, and beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Now, humanly speaking, can you imagine, right, that where evil triumphs, right, where wicked people have their way. And what happens is this, that when good people, innocent people are punished or worse, put to death, and then what they saw in Jerusalem, they were celebrating. Can you imagine what's going through their hearts? I don't want to live in a world like this anymore. Injustice. Right? Many young people are uh, at that point, they want to rise up, right? We, I mean, we need to fix this. We need to set this right, right? I, I need to become a social justice warrior. But what they saw has brought them to the point where, you know what, it's pointless. Nothing can be done. 
We try. It's over. But then they were confused and perplexed by the latest news, right? News reports that morning. Verse 22, Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, right? Which were early at the sepulchre, right? They went there to the tomb and then what happens? They brought back news. They said, we were, we were shocked by this. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive, right? The women came back and says, he's alive. How do we know? Imagine they, they asked the women, how do you know? Well, the angel said so. Verse 24, this was further verified. Right, this, it just gets worse and worse. Right, and certain of them, referring to John and Peter, which were with us, went to the sepulchre. Now, you notice that Jesus is a stranger to them. They are not going to identify John and Peter. Okay, remember, many of the disciples are still in hiding. They're underground. They don't want to be identified. If they can kill Jesus, you know, they, they, can, jolly, they can also hunt down the rest. And so they said, well, certain of them, some of us, right, said that uh, others, they went to the sepulchre said, and found it even so, as the women had said, but him they saw not. They couldn't find him. Okay? So now they're in a situation where they can neither go forward nor go backwards. Neither here nor there, why? Because at this point, they don't know what to do. Okay? The founder of the church is gone. Either dead or missing. What do they do now? And you see, the thing about this, when you and I are in the dark, is it's time to go back to the light of the scriptures. Right? It's time to go back to where we have a reference point that will lead and guide us in the way. Because Jesus, the next thing he did was not to comfort them, not to sayang them, not to soothe them, but he expounded the scriptures concerning himself. He went back to state the things that are true, the things that are fulfilled, and to refocus their thoughts on these things. Right? Verse 25, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, here, He's talking about being a fool as in being ignorant right, of spiritual truth. And not only that, not only ignorant, but the other thing is this. There is a willful choice, right? Slow of heart to believe all. All that the prophets have spoken, right? Now, obviously, the, Jesus is not going to tell them about the Gospels because they're not, they have not been recorded yet, right? He's referring to the Old Testament. And in there, again and again, the prophets had already prophesied, right, about the birth of Christ, right, the tribe that he will be born, you know, he'll come from, the uh, city of his birth, Bethlehem, all right, uh, that he will be born of a virgin, right? This was a sign, not just a, born of a woman, but of a virgin. Uh, he will be of the line direct, he will be a direct descendant of the line of David uh, because he's not born, right, uh, not as a result of a man. You notice one thing, because God actually cursed the last king of Israel. No descendant, right, from King Jeconiah would ever ascend to the throne. But both Joseph and Mary were direct descendants of David. And Jesus still had the right to rule. Right, as a descendant. All these things, right? Like how he would die was prophesied in the Psalms. Right? And that he will rise again. And, and you know, Isaiah chapter 53. Now, all these things. All right, it says, look, from young, these men, these Jews had been taught. Right? These things, they were waiting for the fulfillment of all this. And he says, why are you dragging your feet? Right? Slow of heart. It says, 
to, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, is this ought not Jesus to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? In other words, he's saying, yeah, shouldn't all this have happened? Right now, they remember, they're sad, they're disappointed um, because of the great injustice. This, this ought not to be happening in Jerusalem. It ought not to be happening in Israel. This ought not to be done by our leaders. But here Jesus said, ought not Christ to have suffered all these, uh, to suffer these things, notice, and to enter into his glory? So verse 27 says, okay, here's a refresher course, right? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Now, Moses, notice, the first five books of the Old Testament, right? Those five books, were Moses and then the prophets, the major and the minor prophets of that. So in beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, right? His death, his life, his, uh, you know, sorry, his life, his death, right? His resurrection, right? Even his birth, And they still didn't connect. Okay? But it was necessary to go back to the Word of God, right? To point them back to that starting point. Because why? You and I, in those low moments, we go with our feelings. We go with our own thoughts. We go with our own thinking. What did Jesus do? He brings them back to what is true. And what is true? based on the Word of God. And so we see at this point, Jesus reveals his identity. Now, verse 28, right, they, they, they have reached Emmaus, and, but Jesus looks, makes it look like he's wanting to continue to travel on. Verse 28, and they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, abide with us, right? Stay with us. Therefore, it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. Now, Obviously, one thing to take note here, there are no street lamps. Okay? And you can't use your cell phone as a torchlight. It's going to be pitch dark. All right? The day is over. So they said, just stay with us, hang out with us, all right? Travel tomorrow morning. This voice, towards evening and the day is far spent, and he went in to tarry with them. So Jesus is okay. And so they had dinner, right? Look at verse 30. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open. And they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. Right? At that moment, right? In the middle of breaking the bread, and right, he's dividing it up, he blessed blessed that and gave it to them. Now, we're not talking about the physical eyes. Here, the spiritual eyes were open. They finally recognized that Jesus was there with them. Wow, what, what an application, right? Do you realize as they were walking, this, this walking down the road to Amos was not the usual, maybe like, oh, let's go to Amazon. We're going to soak in the baths there. You know, we're just going to have a good time there. That was a sad journey. It was a difficult journey. A painful journey. And yet, all this time, I want you to think about this. All this time, Jesus was with them. But they didn't notice it. Why? Because you and I sometimes get very wrapped up with what's going on, we forget that the Lord is journeying with us. The Lord is with us. The Lord has not forsaken us. He has not, you know, abandoned us. But we don't see it, right? Because we're seeing whatever is bothering us to the point where we don't see what God is doing. And here they finally, they recognize, oh, but notice, the moment, that wake-up moment, they recognized him, they knew him, whoosh, he vanished out of his sight, right? Because this resurrection body is different. It's a physical body, but 
It's, it's also a supernatural body. It's able to do things that no human being can do. He disappeared. He vanished out of sight. But that was the desired effect because it was a wake-up moment for them. It was a reminder to them, hey, look, there's something important to do. Guys, wake up. And now they reflected on the time that they spent with him. Verse 32, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Right? At this moment, everything started to boom. It came together because now from the sorrow, the disappointment, the letdown, uh, the grieving, the mourning, all these things, that, all these emotions that were mixed in, maybe even the anger at the people who, the wicked, Right, sinners who have perpetuated this injustice. Now there was a burning of conviction. Right, walking and communing with Jesus made their hearts burn with conviction. Not only just talking to him, you notice something here. In particular, when he opened to them the scriptures and their scriptural understanding. Why? Remember, he says, ought not the Son of Man, right? They understood the purpose now. God's plan must be fulfilled. The plan of salvation must be laid down. Right? This has to happen because there is no other way possible, right, for any of us to be saved and at this moment, they realized, you know what? We are heading in the wrong direction. Verse 33, and they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. It's the middle of the night, remember? Right? It took them a day's journey to get there. Right? Maybe the whole afternoon. Now they rush back, right? In the darkness. Because why? This is urgent. Returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 gathered together. They were missing in church. All right. Here's an assembly, right? The 11 gathered together and them that were with them. There was an assembly here, right? Remember, this is Sunday evening. They weren't there. But they finally showed up. They showed, better to show up late than not to show up at all. But I want us to realize something here because you and I can and will get into a situation, all right, at times, I don't feel like it. All right? Oh, guess what? Even the preacher or the pastor will have days that he doesn't feel like it. Doesn't feel like being here. Doesn't feel like preaching. But you notice something. The time spent with the Lord in communion, in fellowship, drives all these things away. Our natural reaction is when things happen, we want to get away from the things of God, from the house of God, and from the people of God. But these two recognize, you know what, we are heading the wrong direction, turn back, you turn. There were others that were not there, right? Thomas was not found in church, right? John 20 verse 24. Right, Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. John 21, look at verse 2 and 3, because here it says, They were together, Simon, Peter, and Thomas, called Didymus, and so on and so forth. Verse 3, Simon, Peter, said unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. Right, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, right, so on and so forth, the sons of Zebedee. Now, they're all like, I don't know, I guess it's time to look at a new way of life, maybe a new profession, new income, whatever. Um, in, you know, we are quitting this apostle business. But this time spent with the Lord, right, brought back the sweet fellowship, reminded them of what they had been missing, right? But you see, the longer you and I are away, Right, from the presence of the Lord, from fellowship with the Lord, from uh, the presence of the saints, the less we feel like 
being there. They came back and then notice they bought, I, I almost have this picture, they just barged in through the door, right? Verse 34 saying, the Lord is risen indeed and had appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. So, so you can see they, they related all the things that happened, right? As they walked along the road all the way up to dinner time where Jesus broke bread and they, oh, it's him. But I want us to know something here. Look at the way the Lord, you know, draws us back. I think you and I will be thinking there ought to be lightning coming down right in the middle of the road, the highway, right? uh, boulders falling down from the mountains or something, you know, and then uh, you know, they, if they're frightened out of their wits and they have to turn back or something. Um, you know, the Lord was very gentle. He asked a lot of questions. Right? Why? For them to think out loud, to process what they're thinking, what they're feeling. Right? But there were doubts. And he understood that, and so he presented evidence of his bodily resurrection. Because this is one of the, it's what we call the elephant that is in the room, and he needs to settle this. All right? Verse 36, and as they thus spake, right? So imagine Jesus vanishes. He's able to whoosh, right? Get into Jerusalem ahead of these two. They show up, they re report to everyone, we saw him, we saw him, he, he was with us, right? And then as they spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. I think we'll have probably a lot of people painting, I think if Jesus just shows up right in the middle of this service right now. All right, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said, uh, said unto them, peace be unto you. Why? Because the natural reaction is shock and fear. Uh, the Americans say shock and awe. All right? Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit, right? He assured them, All right, peace be unto you. He says, relax. Chill, guys, relax. But they were afraid. They thought they saw, they seen a ghost. Right? So they were troubled. And, and so he asked them this question. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? Right? And then there's a the second question. And why do thoughts arise in your heart? This is what's troubling you. Why all this doubt, all this hesitation, and all this deliberation? Right? They're rum ruminating again and again, over and over again, all these thoughts, thinking through, nah, can't be, no, what if this, you know, what if that, uh, so on and so forth. Now, they had already seen the news, right? There was verified reports of the empty tomb, right? Uh, the angel, two angels of the Lord had already told them he is risen, he is alive. But they were still troubled. And so he offers them the opportunity to settle their doubts with the physical evidence, right? Verse 39, behold my hands and my feet. Why? Because you can still see the wounds. All right? My hands and my feet, that it is I myself. All right? I'm who, I'm who I say I am. Now, notice he's trying to tell them, look, you are not seeing some sort of uh, apparition. You're not seeing some sort of what? holographic projection. Right? You're not seeing things. It's me. Is it behold? Is it my hands are feet? You can, you can see it. Then he says, don't stop there. Not just what you see. Handle me and see. Touch it for yourself. Remember he told Thomas, reach into his side. Is it for a spirit had not flesh and bones as ye see me have? All right. And by the way, with the kind of wounds that he have, he had, right? You could see the bones. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. See for yourself. Satisfy every doubt there is. Now, by way of principle, I, I think there's something here to consider, right? I may be talking to someone here this morning. Now, you have heard 
the preaching of God's word over and over and over again. But deep down, you're still like wondering, I don't know if I can trust the Bible. I don't know if this is true or not. Right? I'm here maybe because mom and dad told me to come. Maybe uh, my husband told me to come. Maybe my friend asked me to come. Right? Or whatever it may be. Now, realize this. He shows them all this, even the visual proof, right? But... It's not the visual proof that's the real issue. It's what we're holding on inside. Choosing whether to believe or choosing unbelief. Acts 1 verse 3, because remember, they they struggle with doubt here, as this chapter will show. But Acts 1 3 tells us, right, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Right, 1 John 1 verse 1, John, as an apostle, declares he's an eyewitness right, of Christ's resurrection. So that which was from the beginning, right? Remember, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was God, right? Right at the beginning of all things, right before the creation of all things, right, he was already there. Now, says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, okay? So John makes it very clear. His physical bodily presence Right, it was important. Right, we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Right, we've heard him, we've seen him, we looked upon him, we touched him. But the disciples were struggling, right? Luke 24, verse 41. And while they yet believed, not for joy. Now, so. Here comes a very interesting thing. They believed. All right? But it didn't bring joy. Okay? This belief, in other words, was half-hearted. All right? It's halfway. Okay? They see it. They see it as a fact. All right? They cannot deny it. They can even handle. They can even put their finger into the wounds. But you know what? They were not rejoicing because it has not hit home. Right? They believe, yet believed not for joy and wondered. So what did he do? He said, he said unto them, have ye, any, have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a an honeycomb and he took it and did eat before them. There. Now you see, right? Proof. Jesus was a Baptist, right? Baptists love to eat. Right? right after the resurrection, he used to say, come, go any food. No, okay, I'm kidding. He shows them, right? He's human, right? 100% man, 100% God, right? And as a human, what? He also has to eat. And he's showing them, all right, you have any food? I don't know. I like this verse. I like, man, when we meet him, I think we're going to hang out and just have food. All day. And we can ask questions, we can talk, whatever. But I want us to see something here. He did that to show, look, I'm alive. This is a physical bodily resurrection. Right? And, but you see, in their hearts, they were struggling with this. Right? Because knowing, by right, knowing this ought to bring joy, but it did not. I'm going to just jump to the next point. Um, turn with me to Luke chapter 24, verse 44, right? The explanation of the commission. Because at this point, now that he settles this, all right, there's joy. Now he says, okay, we need to get down to work. Verse 44, right? And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Right? The, the scriptures that prophesy and prescribe the solution for all mankind. Okay? The death, burial, and the resurrection of the Messiah. And this was done 
Jesus had fulfilled all the requirements in, look at verse 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Notice, he, it was necessary for him to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, right? Necessary, he ought to do it. It must be, must be done. It should be done. It behooved Christ to do so. Why was this mentioned? I think that's an important personal application for all of us, right? Whatever you and I are going through, right? And we may go through down, down into the valley of sorrow, right? There may be tough times. We may have to navigate very difficult waters, but I want us to realize something here. Is this according to God's plan? That's the fundamental question. Yeah, because it's, he's pointing out, look, all these things were necessary. This had to happen to Christ. No matter how awful it was, right? How painful, how unjust. And yet, what he's pointing out is, it's okay. This is according to plan. God didn't make any mistakes here. Right? God knows what he's doing. And because of that, you and I can rest. You and I can have joy knowing what? That he's in control. Okay? And he's pointing out all these things were necessary. Right? So don't worry about it. Don't think any more about this. But then he's pointing out in the next verse, but right, here is something I need you to think about and to work on, right? Our mission. To declare this, there's this message, right, to the whole world. Verse 47, right? I'll just read this for context again. It says, And so to them, thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins, Right? Repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. Now, the first part, verse 46, it says, all those things, right, what Christ had to suffer, right, and to die, it says, it should be done, it must be done, it was done. Completed. But then look at verse 47 and 48. It says that this message, right, this gospel could be declared, is it that repentance, right, turning to God, and then what happens? And placing our faith, right, turning to Christ. Repentance and remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins, right? Trusting that only the blood of Christ can do that for us is, should be preached in his name. This is our part. It must be done. It ought to be done. It has to be done. It is necessary. It should be preached in his name among all nations, among, among all people, starting in Jerusalem, and you are witnesses. Okay? You're witnesses. Notice, the tough part was already done. But then now the commission, right? He says, this is our part. Why was, was it necessary to first bring home the truth about the resurrection before talking about this? Very simple. Anytime you and I, we try to share the gospel, we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, as a savior, right, of all mankind, savior to any wretched sinner, you know, deep down, you're afraid. You're afraid. Afraid what other people might do to us. What they might say. And you know what? The one who is now telling them, go, is the one who said, you know what? They killed me. I came back. 
He's the one that's telling us, you know, you fear not, you know, the one that can destroy your body. Fear the one that can not only destroy the body but cast into hell or will guarantee you a direct passage straight home in the presence of God. What's the worst thing that can be done to a believer? We go home early. You go home as a hero. You go home in honor. Hopefully not in dishonor. Right? We go home, we get to return home. I mean, what's the worst thing that someone can do when we tell them about Christ the Savior? They send us home early. Death has no power over the believer. Throughout the New Testament, the term that is used with respect to a disciple who dies is the word sleep. We slept last night. We woke up this morning. Tonight, when we get tired, we sleep again. We wake up again. There is a certainty here until one day, right? Until one day, finally, we die. But even then, that physical death, what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ will happen to everyone who is in Christ. There is a hope of the resurrection of the dead. I'm going to just um, jump straight down to uh, our conclusion here, our closing thoughts. Why see ye the living among the dead? Are we doing that, Pastor? Well, let me put it to you this way. I've seen people live as if Christ is still dead, still powerless, because they refuse to turn, to acknowledge, to appropriate, to use the power that is already given to all who are saved. Right? Why do we sorrow like there's no hope? Right? Why, you know... Again, the resurrection, Christ rising from the grave. I want us to notice something here. It's our victory. How so? Because not just with respect to our salvation, but today as we go through this life, it's our present power as a believer. It is also our future hope right, of the resurrection because what happened to him? Will happen to us. What happens, right? If it didn't happen for him, it didn't. It's not going to happen for us, right? That's. You can go back and read First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Long discussion about this, right? It goes back and forth. Basically, Christ has to be the first one. In fact, he's described as he's the first fruit, right, of all who are going to be resurrected. But one thing here, the job. Okay, he's completed his part. And now it's our responsibility to be the faithful witnesses. Right? Even for the disciples who encountered him on the Emmaus Road, realize this. As soon as they recognized what the Lord had done, they went back, they told everybody else. My question for you and I is this, is he real in our lives? Okay? I'm not saying... Is it real as if uh, you never have a problem in your life? No. I'm saying, does he walk with you and take you through the valleys and also to the mountaintops? Right? Does he walk with us? And frankly, I would rather have him walk with us and go through time or trouble than that he's not there at all. Because I am going my own way, right? What about you?